Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. George S. Patton Jr. starred as an Olympic athlete in the 1912 Stockholm Games. In 1916, under John J. Pershing, Patton joined the Mexican expedition against the paramilitary forces of Mexican revolutionary Francisco Pancho Villa. When the US entered the First World War, Patton joined the new tank corps and commanded the US tank school in France, leading tanks into combat who would be wounded near the end of the war. But Patton is best remembered for his exploits on the battlefields of World War II. And this is what we're looking at in this episode from Morocco through Sicily to D-Day. Joining me is Kevin Hemel. Kevin has worked as a historian for the US Army and is currently doing work for the Arlington National Cemetery. He's also a tour guide for Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours and is the author of Patton's Photographs, War As He Saw It. And his new book is Patton's War, An American General's Combat Leadership, Volume 1, November 1942 to July 1944. So let's get started. Um, the Patton family, who were they? Um did did he have a military background? Was he seeped in the army? Uh, I would say yes. So his grandfather was killed during the Civil War. Uh, his grandfather was a colonel. And then his father uh, went to VMI, Virginia Military Institute, like the grandfather, but never really served in the army. He became a lawyer. Uh, the family was had moved out to California. But um, when George was little, uh, the father would have old Confederate generals or officers come to visit and they would tell him grand stories of the Confederacy and fighting in the Civil War. So he grew up with a lot of these war stories in his head. And his father would also read him ancient uh, uh, combat stories, you know, Phoenicians, Romans, Greeks, that kind of stuff. And so he just was uh, lost in a world of it, I guess would be a good way to put it. Um, but a lot of people are raised like that, you know, young men hearing lots of war stories and, and fascinated by it. But um, it's interesting, he goes off to VMI, Virginia Military Institute, and he gets measured for his uniform. And the guy kept tabs on everybody. And he said, you have the exact same measurements as your father and your grandfather when they attended here. So in a way, yes, it's a family tradition. <laughs> he ends up at West Point, though, doesn't he? he? does quite well at West Point. Yes, he goes to West Point. No, he doesn't do well. He actually has to stay back a year. Some people say it's controversial whether or not he was dyslexic. I can tell you for a fact he was dyslexic. How do I know that? I'm dyslexic, and I can see it in his writings and his frustrations. Anyone who's dyslexic knows that pain of not being able to understand something that comes so simply to everybody else and how you're falling behind and you're panicking. You don't know why, what the problem is, and that's very reflective in his letters so he repeats his freshman or plebe year at West Point. You know, he's always kind behind, but he, you know, he does great in history. He does great in military comportment and stuff. It's math, you know, that is his real nemesis that he fights with. But he does, he does graduate very proudly. Looking at that early part of his career, he does see, was well, he's, it's, it's, I'm not, now being British, they're not Mexican wars, are they? They punch your, Via Pancho Villa, yeah. Well, how's that officially titled? That campaign, skirmish, policing action? What is it? <laughs> Expedition, much like the British Expeditionary Force. Uh, this is the 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 or the incursion into Mexico or the expedition into Mexico under John J. Pershing. Um, it's basically one of these cases where you're trying to fight a conventional war, where you're fighting an insurgency, and so it's not very successful. But Patton has one of the small victories of the whole campaign where he takes two vehicles and basically flanks a ranch house where he suspects some banditos are. And, and he's correct. And they come out on horseback and they're running away. And Patton pulls out his ivory handled pistol and fires. And the guys from the other vehicles do it. And the guys on horseback turn around and come straight at him. And he runs out of bullets and has to reload. And he said clay powder was coming down on top of him because of the bullets hitting the wall behind him. He reloads and he manages to knock one of the guys down. He shoots the horse and they eventually kill all three. Patton helps with killing one, but he puts two notches on the handle of the pistol saying, I got two of them. But he promises himself 
He will never go into combat with one pistol. He'll always have two. And that's where you get the famed two ivory-handled pistols. pistols. That he carries with him everywhere. Now, he actually doesn't. He says that he does. But he, in fact, the front cover of my book, he's got the two pistols on. And that is only one of two photographs of him actually wearing two pistols. All the other photographs in World War II, he's only got one. And what's ironic, and he says when he gets to Europe, he goes, they're too heavy. I'm not wearing two anymore. And the second picture of him with two pistols was taken seconds after this first photo. And that photo is actually in the book. But every veteran I interview from Third Army said, yo, Patton came up with the two ivory handled with the two ivory handled pistols. And I go, no, he only had one. Yeah, I'm looking through the pictures of him now. So if he's in his dress uniform, he's not wearing them. And if he's if he's out and about, you often just see him from one side. So you assume the pistol's on the other side. Yep. Have I never realized? And he, and he actually does say in his diary at one point, he goes, I can't wear two pistols anymore. They're just too heavy. And that was the reason he switched to one. But yeah, it's, it's November 8th, 1942, that he comes ashore in Morocco with two ivory handled pistols. And, and all the photographs of him, in, of him in Tunisia, in Sicily, in England, and, for, and the only one, only one pistol on that hip. Before we get to the Second World War, you know, Patton does get across and just the action, prop, real action in the First World War as well. So, you know, we're building a picture of, of a man of action uh, in command. What's his, what's his First World War like? So he goes over as a staff officer for Gen- General John J. Pershing, who he followed into Mexico. He's in charge of like the motor pool and a few other things. And he's kind of waiting like all staff officers or all officers for a position to command an infantry unit. World War I, that's what you did. You commanded infantry. And he hears about this new invention called the tank. He kind of wrestles with himself. He goes, if you go infantry, you got to guarantee leading men in combat. If I go with this newfangled tank thing, by the time we get it all organized, the war might be over. And so it's a serious debate, but he decides to do it. Uh, he completely excels at it. And it's it's kind of the perfect match because Patton had been in charge of a machine gun unit at one point. He, he owned his own car and he loved working on it. So he knew about the combustion engine and he spoke French. And the tanks that the Americans are going to use in World War One are French tanks. So he's, he has the basic knowledge of the combustion engine, machine guns, you know, as opposed to bolt action. And he speaks French. So those three things really perfectly, perfectly align him to work with the French to understand Renault light tanks. He actually goes to the factories to see them being made and makes recommendations and is teaching tank tactics to his soldiers, none of which have ever been in a tank, neither has Patton. And he eventually learns enough to drive a tank that when they arrive at his training facility, he has to drive the tanks off the uh, trains because no one else is qualified to do it. So he trains these guys really solidly. He says, if a tank unit has anything, it's going to have discipline. And he learned a lot of his discipline from John J. Pershing, who was always immaculately dressed. Then they go into combat in mid-September at what's called the Battle of Saint Miel. And this was sort of a bargain Pershing made with the Allied generals was let the American ha- army fight its own battle. And they said, well, we need to at Moose Argonne. And he said, well, okay, we'll fight this battle in two or three days. We'll snip off this bulge in our lines. And as soon as it's done, we'll move everything north and we'll be part of Moose Argonne. So Pat is going to lead his tanks in battle. It, it rained the night before. It's a very muddy battlefield. He realizes he can't communicate with his tanks, so he gets out on foot and follows them. He goes up to the top of this hill. He starts walking down. He bumps into a brigadier general named Douglas MacArthur. The two of them stand there talking, and a German artillery barrage starts marching up the hill. Everybody ducks, but Patton and MacArthur, they stand there talking while this barrage passes over. And Patton will then go down. He takes two towns, Essie and Penns. The tankers stop at a bridge. They're afraid it's mine. So he walks across the bridge to prove it's not mine. The tankers follow. He gets on the tank. He notices paint chipping off the tank. It's machine gun bullets. So he has to jump off the tank. And he doesn't want to look like he's retreating. So he retreats at an angle so that his men don't see him walking backwards. I mean, all of this stuff is in his head, the importance of being a leader and moving forward. 
And then he takes part in the Moose Argonne offensive. Same problem, muddy area. Tanks are getting bogged down. And he actually goes out with shovels with his staff, shoveling out trenches so they're shallow enough for the tanks to keep moving. And as the battle goes on, they start running out of fuel. The tanks are breaking down. Uh, and Patton decides he's going to lead his own offensive with his staff officers. He's armed with a, a cane uh, and his pistol. He doesn't pull the pistol out. And he gets shot in the lower abdomen. And there is some controversy whether he was shot moving forward or going backward where the bullet hole entry was. And Patton would even say that Pershing, when he heard guys around his office going, yeah, Patton got shot in the ass. Pershing said, yeah, well, it wouldn't bother any of you because you sit on your butt so much. They're so callous, the bullet wouldn't penetrate. And so Patton took a great deal of pride in that. He was actually in the hospital recovering on November 11th, which was his birthday uh, in 1918. And it really depresses him because World War I was where he was going to make his career as a warrior. And there's no war to prove himself with anymore. And so he will, between wars, he will exceed going to military schools. He'll also go into depressions and drink too much uh, and cheat on his wife. He'll do some kind of dastardly things. But And there's a big temptation, like with all armies after World War I, for the soldiers to get out of the army. There's no opportunity anymore. But he sticks it out. The, the army becomes so small. They Not only do they not allow tanks, they won't allow the word tanks. You have to say armored car because the head of the cavalry wants nothing to do with tanks. Horses will have a role in the wars forever. You know, these tanks are kind of a novelty. But uh, he sticks with it. And as the war clouds kind of gather over Europe and Asia and, and start getting closer to the United States, he will begin to excel. He will take command of an armored brigade and then an armored division. And then right about the time of Pearl Harbor, he, he's risen to two-star rank. They make him a corps commander and they send him out to California, the California area. It's actually a number of states. And he's going to start a tank school in the desert because where are the American forces going to fight the Germans first in North Africa? And he is going to train all the units that are going to go over for torch, uh, all the troops in the United States that will be going over for torch. And so that's kind of George between World War I and World War II. But what's fascinating, that interwar period throughout the whole, well, no, not throughout the the majority of the period, he's senior to like both Ike and Bradley, isn't he? And it's only right as at some some point in the war that that Ike somehow becomes senior senior to him. I'm sure Ike, Ike was... At one point, they're serving together, aren't they, somewhere uh, on the same posting? Well, they serve immediately after World War I at Camp Meade, a place called Camp Colt. And Eisenhower is a big tank proponent, and him and Patton become really good friends. Their wives get along, and they start writing articles about the tank in the future. And the Army in 1920 slashes the budget. This is where they get rid of the tanks and everything, where they get rid of the tank corps. And they basically tell Eisenhower and Patton to shut the hell up, stop it with all this talk about tanks. And so Eisenhower goes into the infantry, Patton goes back to the cavalry, and they they continue writing letters and everything to each other. They don't see each other. But when Patton becomes a brigade commander in the Second Armored Division, he writes Eisenhower, and Eisenhower's like, I would love to come and serve under you, you know, to be part of this armor unit. And but Eisenhower gets sent somewhere else. But you're right. When Patton was a two star general in charge of Second Armored Division and then the the uh, the Army tr- Desert Training Area, Eisenhower is a one star general on the staff of George C. Marshall. He's an operations officer under George C. Marshall. Marshall sends him over to England to start preparing for the troops. And then when the decisions to do North Africa, Eisenhower is going to get that second star and he's going to start. Be, he'll, he'll be in command of Operation Torch and all the subsequent campaigns. So who selects Patton for for Torch? I don't is is Patton one of Marshall's uh because Marshall had his had, had had the men that he liked to work with, didn't he? Yes. He championed some people. And Patton was one of them. Um when Patton got stationed at Fort Meyer, uh he was very lucky. It was the same time that Marshall was uh made uh, chief of staff of the army and Marshall's house is being reconstructed. You know, they got construction crews so Marshall moves in with Patton. How's that for a career move, right? And so, uh, you know, they send Eisenhower to England. They say, you're going to be in charge of Torch. 
And so it really is Eisenhower that picks his three core commanders, Patton, Frendall, and Ryder, to lead Torch. But Marshall, during the Louisiana maneuvers, kind of turns to reporters and says, this guy's going to have a role in our next operation. You know, so it's, it's pretty well known. But technically, yes, it is Eisenhower that calls Patton. Was he a well-known figure in the U.S. before Torch, Patton? I don't know how big American military figures were kind of before, you know, actual hostilities. So he's well-known from the Mexican uh, Expeditionary Force because of he shoots those banditos and brings them back actually strapped to the hoods of his vehicles. World War I, he gets a lot of press because he's the head of the tank corps and he accompanies more, uh, uh, Pershing on the way back. And so and I've read, I've seen the newspaper articles about him in Mexico and World and Patton kept, I mean, yeah, Patton kept all that stuff. And so by the time you get to World War II, he's a known entity. In fact, during Louisiana maneuvers, he actually makes the front cover of Life magazine. And Life magazine was like, you know, all the network televisions put together back in the 1940s. He gets the Western task force. Now, I don't know if that was the best one or, the, or I don't know if it's the most prestigious or the least prestigious to be at. He's kind of out on his on, on his limb because, well, I did wonder because he's out on his own on Morocco. If he has least support, so they thought we'll give it to him. So I, how does he perform anyway? It's, I, it, it's a amphibious assault. We haven't done particularly many of them. They're a, kind of an unknown quantity within themselves. Um, how does his troops under his command and he, he perform on that uh, assault on the... It's Morocco, isn't it? Morocco, yeah. So, you know, uh, my mentor, Martin Blumenson, said that the Moroccan campaign proved Patton's brilliance. And I respectfully disagree because the enemy was just not the same as fighting the Germans. They don't fight the Germans in Morocco. They fight the Vichy French who are looking for a way to surrender honorably. Um, so if, if you realize if they're starting off with that mindset, they're not, you know, super, really super aggressive. But he performs competently. He does everything that's required of him. He gets the troops ashore. He gets himself ashore as soon as he can, around 12 noon on that day. His, it's a three-pronged attack. He's got the second armored division landing in a place called Safi. He goes in at what's called Fadala Beach near Casablanca. And then there's a northern force under General Truscott taking a Port Luwadi. And Patton's not going to have any communication, really, with that northern and southern force. He's really going to be able to control what he sees in front of him. Uh, He gets a little bit of radio traffic with those other two forces, but mostly it's a blackout. But he succeeds. You know, he he gets all the troops ashore. It takes him three days to really finally take Casablanca and the French formally surrender before they attack the city. You know, this is really the start of his war. And when he gets ashore, he's talking to naval officers and and a British liaison officer. And the whole time he's eyeing this Arab walking up and down the beach, picking up, you know, American discarded equipment. And he's just kind of watching it. And suddenly this local Moroccan picks up an M1 rifle and he's about to put it in the, the haversack, you know, on his donkey. And Patton sees this and pulls out his 357 Magnum and boom, you know, and the, it doesn't kill the guy, but the round goes right past his head and the guy drops the rifle. He runs off and all the GIs that are like sitting in their Sandy Foxholes, the war kind of moved inland. They all pop up like, what the hell just happened? And to me, that's really Patton announcing himself on the first day of the war, you know, his way with, with a pistol, you know, crack. And that's really where it becomes Patton's war. Yeah. Well, it, it, it sort of becomes theatre. He's, he's a master at theatre uh, whilst at war. And I think you know, Montgomery's potentially the same. It's, it's getting yourself seen and getting yourself about. But he, he does well enough um, to be asked to take over second call, wasn't he? Who suffered defeat at the Kesserian Pass. Humiliation. Is it... Ike that's bringing him forward. Is it Eisenhower who's, who's asking him in? Does he is he the only man for the job in in the theatre? Why why is he championed to take over the second corps? Right. So Lloyd Friedenhall is in command of second corps, and uh, von Arman and then Rommel, two der- German uh, generals or field marshals. I don't think they're field marshals at this point. They attack the Americans. They just drive them about fifteen miles back capture hundreds of prisoners, kill hundreds of Americans. This is an incredibly humiliating loss to the Americans. 
So Eisenhower sends General Ernie Harmon, the commander of Second Armored, out to basically assess what's going on. And Fred Nall basically surrenders his command to him. And he recommends to Eisenhower that Fred Nall be relieved, that there's, he just can't, he doesn't have what it takes. And Eisenhower offers the job to Harmon. And Harmon says, I can't tell you to relieve a commander and then take his spot. I just can't do that. And so they said, OK, we're going to send Mark Clark, who is now in command of the sort of almost non-existent Fifth Army. And Clark says, no, that's a demotion for me to command an army to go down to a corps. And Patton had sworn almost a year earlier that he would take any command offered to him. And so when they offered to Patton, he goes, yeah, show me, you know, get me over there. I'll do it. And um, in fact, he meets Eisenhower on the tarmac in Tunisia uh, to be, you know, and he's getting his instructions to take command. And Patton just goes off. He's, I'm going to kill every damn German I can. And, and he starts crying. So they, they kind of walk off. And one of Eisenhower's aides come to be like, I think this guy's crazy. Are you sure? that you want him to command the Corps? And, and Eisenhower goes, don't even worry. Pat George is very emotional. He's very passionate, but he'll do a great job. And Eisenhower kind of kind of nailed it. I think one thing that strikes me about Patton, um, and oddly enough, I had this conversation, email conversation with another author who's writing about um, Marshall. He was really good. At take, he, he's full of bluster, but he did as he was, t- he took orders and did as he was told. Ultimately, mostly, yeah, yeah, but he's not—he's not MacArthur, uh, yeah, you know, who thought himself too good for everything else. On the whole, he's a—he's—he understands that his job is to take orders and go where he's told to go. Well, the one uh, time he doesn't do that, it results in his aide, Captain Dick Jensen, getting killed. You know, he moves it, and it was very well covered up. They said, you know, oh, Jensen was off helping something called Benson Force, but I found eyewitness accounts that said no. Pat moved his headquarters forward five miles against Eisenhower's direct order, which was even quoted in the movie, I want a core commander, not a casualty. You are not to go forward all the time. You need to be coordinating these units. And on April 1st, Pat moved his headquarters forward. The Germans see it. They come in and bomb and strafe the area. Dick Jensen is killed about 10 feet from him. And, uh, you know, everything is just locked down after that. No one's allowed to talk to reporters or anything. And, it looks like Patton and Bradley, you know, collaborated a story, concocted a story that that he was killed farther away. But that to me is like the one time he really kind of disobeys orders. And he's he's terrified of being sent home for it. And he follows orders very well after that. He should spend half the world being terrified of being sent home. But um, how does he how does he get that uh, second call into fighting ship? Because it's funny. In my head, it, it's over a long period of time. Actually, when you look at the dates, it's an incredibly short period of time. 12 he days. Takes them, he takes them from defeat to victory. Yeah, 12 days it takes him. Um, it was, it was going to be 10, but he delayed the attack because of weather. He basically goes around to the units and just starts yelling and screaming at people. And one of the most interesting stories is that he comes across like a platoon from the 1st Infantry Division, and one of the soldiers is wearing a british jacket and Patton flips out he confronts the soldier he makes the soldier take it off he says give me the jacket the, the soldier gives him the jacket then Patton takes the jacket and slaps him back and forth in the face with the jacket then he throws it on the ground and orders someone to get this guy a shovel and he makes the guy bury the shovel in the earth then he calls over the lieutenant and says i'm coming back tomorrow and if th- this if anybody's out of uniform, I'm demoting you to the lieutenant, he says. And he gets in his command vehicle and they drive off. And his aide was like, geez, I'm general, wasn't that a little bit extreme? And he says, yes, but they're going to be just fine tomorrow. You know, and so that was his style was, you know, way over the top discipline. But, you know, he's dealing with a defeated unit and he's trying to sort of regain that esprit de corps and his way of doing it. Because I always try to say he has a style of leadership, not the style of leadership. This is how he chooses to do it. And he chooses to use very almost draconian, strict discipline. And that's what he goes around doing uh, with the 1st Infantry, the 1st uh, Armored Division, elements of the 9th Infantry. Is If anybody is anywhere off in their uniforms, they are going to get chewed out. Uh, they're going to get fined. 
and it, it takes effect. In fact, he gets so good on uh, finding guys walking down the street that when guys would see Patton coming, they'd straighten up or if they saw MPs coming, they'd start straightening up. So Patton, when he realizes this, gets doctors that are off duty in the hospitals and makes them walk the streets in front of the MPs and write down all the infractions. So that when the MPs come up and the guys have straightened themselves up, the doctor goes, nope, they have their tie down, their shirt undone. And so it was a very effective method. What's curious is, though, because, you know, is, is this sort of hot-tempered, bl- full of bluster, he didn't necessarily go around firing all his officers for infractions. It, it's, no. it's only, is it only ward he fires eventually? No, there's, there, there's a number of officers he fires, but it, it pains him to have to do it. He doesn't really fire anybody irrationally, like as a gut reaction. You know, he gives them opportunities and chances because it's like we've invested all this time and money in you and you're in command. And when you have one guy in charge, it simplifies everything. If you start relieving people, it's the the staffs will be confused. The troops will be confused. So he really tries to keep everybody intact in their positions. But some guys just can't hack it. There was an incident before D-Day in England that he had to fire one of the uh, commanders of the 5th Armored Division. When the stories came back about how bad this guy was, uh, just yelling at his troops for nothing, he he issued some kind of order about, you know, nighttime lights for vehicles, but he only said tanks. And so the guys only did tanks and he gets mad they didn't do all vehicles, you know, and they're like, sir, you told us, you know, and when Patton finds out how er 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 erratic this guy is. Not only does he get rid of him, but he chews out the division commander saying, you should have gotten rid of him a lot earlier. It shouldn't have had to come to me. So, yes, it, it, we do have that image of him of never firing people. But he did. But it was something that he did not want to do or like doing. He really gave people as many chances as possible. Mm. Now, it's in North Africa. Uh, he first comes into direct contact. Well, it's not first. He obviously didn't first of all. But it, during the Second World War in North Africa, it's the first time he comes into contact with the British. How does he get on? How does he get on with the British? Initially, very well. Um, of course, when you say British, the translation is Montgomery. Well, no, I was just a British in general because I know uh, you know Montgomery could be a you know difficult. <laughs> I just sort of I couldn't work out. I could never quite work out how if, if he was because in many respects he's he's sort of quite a European sort of outlook. He can speak French. And you think, well, surely he should be you know get on well with the British. But you think, no, he, he doesn't seem very pro-British, he's not much of an Anglophile, but then you've got Montgomery, which just muddies all the waters. You're not quite sure he just doesn't like Montgomery. Well, you know, Patton has a liaison officer with him named uh, Robert Enriquez, who he gets along very well with, and they have a very strong relationship. So that's very much a positive. And he knew the British from the First World War, um, and he seemed to have gotten along well there because Pershing went to England before going to France. Um, So it's mostly positive. But, you know, I tell the story that the, the contention with Montgomery, he starts off with a lot of respect for Montgomery, but it's a misunderstanding that begins the, the contention. And that is that uh, Montgomery at one point holds a sort of uh, an after action report school for, for the British Eighth Army to discuss what went wrong and what went right against Rommel. And they invite the Americans and the only two people that come are, are Patton and uh, Beadle Smith, Eisenhower's chief of staff. And Montgomery fam- famously has the rule, no smoking in my headquarters. And so Montgomery's up there talking and, you know, in front of this crowd. And Smith is sitting next to Patton. And Patton starts you know, kind of chafing in his seat and pulls out his cigarette case and pulls out his cigarette. And he's like tapping it on the case to smoke. And Beetle kind of elbows him. He's like, what are you doing? You can't smoke in here. And Patton says, of course, that's right. So when the lecture's over, Patton goes and has lunch uh, with General Lease. And Lease says, you know, what do you think about the fact that you couldn't smoke during that meeting? And Patton says, well, you know, I might be old and stupid, but I'm no, no fool. Like, you know, I wasn't going to smoke in that meeting and cause a riff. Well, the story starts to bleed out and British officers embellish and embellish so that by the time it gets back to Montgomery, the story is that Lee said, what did you think of Montgomery's speech? And Patton said, well, I might be old, fat, and blind, but I'm, but, it, but I'm no fool. Like, you know, I wasn't buying anything Montgomery said, which had to be a huge insult to Montgomery, 
you know, who's this American commander saying my speech is irrelevant? So, but it's a complete misunderstanding that sparks that Patton Montgomery, I guess, rivalry or tension. But by the time you get to Sicily, you know, Montgomery basically tells Patton at one point, listen, you go ahead and take Messina. You take that final city. And Patton's reaction is, you know, what's your game, man? What are you trying to do to me? You know, Patton is so prepared to, for, for, for Montgomery to try to trick him that when Montgomery honestly says, listen, I'm not going to get there in time. You go ahead and take it. Patton's like, oh, you're setting me up for failure, aren't you? You know, he just can't believe that Montgomery would do that. Well, Sicily is very much, you know, it could be said as they sort of a Patton and Montgomery sort of as a competition. Yeah, competition is a good word. Yeah. And, and Montgomery actually tells Patton beforehand, he goes, listen, once we land, I'm not listening to, to Alexander, our boss, you know, the group commander. I'm going to go do my thing. And so Patton is trying to play by the rules when they get into Sicily. And he sees Montgomery taking over his own roads and doing his own thing. And so finally, after about, you know, a week, Patton goes, OK, forget this. I'm doing my own thing, too. And that's when he, you know, takes Palermo and then starts going to Messina. And so he's mad at Montgomery. Um, but he see, but he's like, this is exactly what Montgomery told him he was going to do. And so he starts to, 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 to sort of model, you know, Montgomery's independence and in doing his own thing. But at the same time, he sort of does listen to Alex. Alex Sanders sort of does sort of keep a lid on him. I, oddly enough, well, I, I, Alex is probably quite a good people person. But he, again, I think I've always got the feeling that Patton and I like Alex Sander got on quite well together when they had a direct relationship. Yes, Pat, Patton did kind of respect Alexander. Alexander was a very hands-off, you know, general or field marshal, I have to say. You know, he's not even on Sicily during the entire campaign. You know, he's managing it from either North Africa or one of the islands nearby. And so he's got a panel always has to fly to go talk to him. But yeah, his relationship with him is very positive. In fact, there was an incident where Patton flies over to Montgomery's headquarters and Alexander was flying a little bit later. And Patton, as he's flying in, he sees it. Montgomery has this big lunch table all set and he gets out of his plane and he runs over to Montgomery to shake his hand. He goes, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That showed weakness. And uh, Montgomery opens up the map and they go, "Okay, I'm going to go here and you go there. And they work out their final plans. And Alexander flies in and he says, you know, Montgomery, I haven't heard anything from you. And he goes, well, I've been busy, you know, and he kind of ticking him off. And he goes, "Okay, now show me what your plan is. Tell me your plan. Oh, Patton and I already worked it all out. And Patton's like, are you crazy? You know, and, and Alexander kind of blows his stack at Montgomery. And he's like, I'm your boss. You tell me your plan. And so Montgomery does. And he turns to Patton and says, okay, now tell me your plan. Patton wasn't messing with that. He told him exactly what was going on. So they finished the meeting. And Montgomery says, okay, you guys can leave now. And Patton's like, wait, this guy has this whole lunch table set out. He's not even having us in for lunch. And he just thought that, and, and um, Montgomery gives him like a five cent cigar. And Patton is going to carry that image of that five cent cigar through the rest of the Sicilian campaign. When he had, when he hosts Montgomery at his headquarters, he has a marching band, he has an honor guard, you know, and he says stuff like, this is much nicer than a five cent cigar, you know, and it you know, puts him up for this big lunch and everything like that. So a good, healthy rivalry but it really ends in Sicily because when you get to continental Europe, Montgomery's an army group commander. Patton's just an army commander. So when you see movies like A Bridge Too Far, where they say, oh, it's a debate between Montgomery and Patton's plan. No, 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 that's not right. It was between Omar Bradley and Montgomery. But Patton's the popular figure that people glom onto. So that's why they use him. And how hard is he having to drive his men in Sicily? See, there is this sort of competition where he's sort of, <laughs> trying to get one over on Montgomery. How hard, because this will get to where we're going to next, how hard is he having to drive uh, his troops in Sicily? Very. And, you know, when we think about him driving his troops hard, we think of the drive to Messina. He was actually that way on the way to Palermo, you know, because he could see that Palermo was the key to getting to Messina. And so he's really pushing the troops hard there. Oh, I, I can tell you this, and I learned this from interviewing a veteran, this guy was with the second armored division and his tank gets knocked out on the way into the beach and him and a buddy just go and live in a house in Sicily. 
And he says when army trucks would roll by, they'd run behind them and guys would throw food out for them. But this becomes such a problem. So many soldiers are drifting behind the lines and living with civilians that eventually Patton has to send trucks down with, you know, in the announcement of joint, get back to your unit now and nothing will happen to you. And if you don't, you will be court-martialed. And right before Patton slapped the first soldier, because he actually slapped two, one of the division commanders told him, hey, the only problem we have is with gold brickers not wanting to fight. So Patton was really passionate about soldiers not wanting to be aggressive and fight. And it's a shame because a lot of the Sicilian front, the Italians are surrendering immediately and in some cases pointing out where the German defenses are. But that is really going to get under Patton's skin, that he's trying to reach these goals. He's trying to beat Montgomery, but his army doesn't seem to have that same energy that he does. And that those two things are going to clash in two different hospitals in Sicily. Uh, well, that gets us to the slapping. Tell us about the slapping incident, because it really is the thing that blights his career. It, it kind of pulls him up short. Yep, very much so. So uh, he slaps one soldier from the 1st Infantry Division. And then within a week, slaps another soldier with the 45th. He's visited a hospital first, hasn't he? And they're the kind of on the itinerary. There's just a bed with some guy with seemingly no injury. Correct. And he's and he's coming down the rows of guys that are seriously injured, you know, and talking to them or sitting silently and saying a prayer. Um, and then he gets to these, this, you know, these soldiers that are they're just kind of sitting there. It's the second soldier that he smashed, smacks in the head and goes to pull his own pistol out. And, he, and, and the doctor in charge actually knew the Patton family from Massachusetts because that's where Patton's wife was. And he wrote about it. And he said that Patton turned to him and Patton burst out into tears and said, do you see what I have to deal with here? These, you know, I can't lead an army where these guys are just retreating into the hospitals. Now, both those guys had seen a lot of combat, saw their friends get killed, have been going without sleep. You know, they weren't cowards by any mark of the word. You know, they they didn't want to go back. And so Patton just loses it. You know, it's something that shocks the staff. Uh, there Actually, there was a, a group of soldiers in another tent, and they heard this big kerfuffle, and a nurse runs in, and she says, oh, my God, Patton just slapped a soldier. And the men cheered because they felt like Patton was slapping the face of everyone back home in the United States who didn't care about the war that they felt weren't being, they weren't being supported by, which is a very common thing for soldiers fighting far away from home. They feel forgotten. But any doctor back in the United States, when they heard about it, they're like, this is atrocious. You know, and even Eisenhower said, if he had done that at an aid station close to the front, that would have been fine. But to do it all the way in the back of the hospital, that's, that, that's unheard of, that, that we can't tolerate that. But Eisenhower, you know, reprimands Patton he says, you know, apologize to the soldiers and all the doctors and nurses. But it's a different officer that comes up to him. Um, I think it's uh, Lucas that says, you know, what you ought to do is you ought to re- apologize to all the troops, you know, and that'll that'll get you on good with Eisenhower. And Patton follows through and he does it. But that, what's amazing is he's done all this apologizing before the story's even broken. Yeah. And, and they put a lid on it. They hide all the documents. They put it. Omar Bradley puts his in a safe, a complaint by the doctors and reporters. But wounded soldiers are being sent home, you know, to go to hospitals. So the word that's buzzing all around Sicily is eventually going to make it back to the United States. And a sort of a um, an expose radio personality, he makes the announcement over the radio and it, it, it kind of explodes a second time. And it's just such a headache for Eisenhower because he, he had to tamp this thing down. His commander that did such a brilliant job, he has to reprimand. And like for about a month or two, everything's quiet. And then kaboom, it explodes in the states. And senators and congressmen are going into the wells of their respective houses and speaking out against Patton. And even Eisenhower, you know, like, how could he let this happen? Harry Truman is like, look at that. It's the Officers Protection Club. And, you know, Senator Harry Truman had been, a, you know, an officer in uh, World War I. But he wasn't a West Pointer. And he saw this as, you know, those West Pointers all sticking together. But Eisenhower does deliver a letter or, you know, he he has a a review done of the whole thing, has it written up. and They send it to Congress and they said, "Okay, you've dealt with it. And of course, the bottom line, what he's really saying is I need this guy for future battles. You know, and Eisenhower really sticks his neck out. Now, after this, Patton is going to go into a big depression. 
He's going to start drinking way too much. Uh, there's officers that don't want him to visit because he drinks all the liquor out of their liquor cabinets. I mean, it's it's bad. And every time that Eisenhower comes through the area and visits him, he says, George, I've got a job for you in the future war. Don't worry. You're going to you're going to command an army. You're going to fight the Germans. Just not right now. And then Eisenhower would leave and he'd go, oh, Eisenhower, that son of a bit, you know, and he would just rage about Eisenhower and Eisenhower was doing everything in his power to keep George in the game. And Patton is wants nothing to do with it. Eisenhower's turned his back on me. He's a traitor, you know, and that's where a lot of the bitterness really starts with Eisenhower. I wonder how culpable possibly Eisenhower might be because, you know, it, in some respects, the slapping's part of uh, Patton's bravado. He's been kicking, punching and shouting at men for months to try and get them going, get them moving, to turn his unit round. And this is sort of a culmination of it. And no one's held, no one's stopped him. No one's pulled him up on it. Yeah, if somebody had said something to Patton, you know, even as far back as November 8th, you know, when he, in 1942, stop it, I think he would have pulled back. But Eisenhower does not interject in all of these. We talked about getting slapped in the face with the jacket. On November 8th, when he comes ashore, No, it's the second day. He actually kicks a guy in the butt. He physically kicks him, you know, to get him to do his job. And it it becomes so widespread known from the troops under Patton that he will hit you physically that it almost becomes a badge of honor. I mean, that's how severe it is. And so when this thing finally happens, yeah, there is some blame to Eisenhower because he should be inspecting what he's expecting of Patton. And he just doesn't. And so when this happens... It is, it's almost a reflection of Eisenhower's lack of leadership in this incident. You want the results, but you don't necessarily want to see how they get the results. And, and Eisenhower, I think he's a very good commander for all the stuff he does, but he's not perfect. A lot of the Mediterranean theater is a learning theater for him. So when he does launch the invasion of D-Day and everything, he's a much more experienced, much more confident commander than he was in North Africa and Sicily and Italy. Did, does I presume uh, Marshall's still batting for? Because Marshall's the other other you know, puppet master, as it were. It doesn't break his confidence with Marshall. Yeah, uh, um, he. Uh, you mean Patton doesn't break his confidence with Marshall? Yeah, yeah. In fact, when the Nutsford incident happens, when he reveals his presence to the public, when he does that again, Eisenhower has to decide. Do I send this guy home? Do I keep him? And Marshall writes to Eisenhower and says, you're right. This is a tough decision. You can either keep our most experienced commander who has fought Rommel. Actually, he hadn't and knows how to lead our armies in victory. Or you pick a green commander who's not as experienced. The decision's yours, Ike. You know, but you can see that Marshall is kind of greasing the skids, you know, for Pat. And he's like, you know, this isn't really a decision you need to make, Eisenhower. You know you got to keep Pat. So that so he'll be fine. Marshall, Marshall's got his back, kind of thing. Exactly. That's a perfect way yeah, to put yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So, how long is he on the bench for? Is Patton in Sicily? I can't quite picture that. August, September, October, November, December, January. So, I would say six months before he gets brought up. It's, it's but before time. he's brought up to England, and then you know, from January forty-four to July. He's in England. So what is his, because he, he's not a D-Day commander. What is the assignment he's given in in, uh, in Britain? His, his assignment, clearly straightforward, is to command Third Army. And that's what he does when, from day one. He's going to go north um, to a place called Peaver, Peaver Hall, which is uh, a little bit north of Nutsford. And that's where first his staff will arrive. And then the troops are going to start, you know, arriving and he'll train them. You know, in the movie, Pat, and they say that, you know, you got no job. You're going to fake out the Germans, you know, uh, with Operation Fortitude. Patton really didn't do anything about Operation Fortitude. This was a British idea to make the Germans think that Patton was going to attack in a place called pas calais And he doesn't really have to do anything. They're doing all the fake radio transmissions. You know, they're, they're mentioning Patton's name and everything. The one thing he does do, he goes to East Anglia to watch airplanes take off so that the Germans, you know, will think he's over there. But what happens is that the British originally say that Bradley's going to lead the attack and they're monitoring German communications. And then they switch 
And they said, okay, Bradley's going to step up to higher command. Patton is going to lead the attack into Pas de Calais. And the Germans aren't reacting. And so the, these, these British spy masters, they're trying to like, okay, what do we do? How do we got to get the word to the Germans? And then coincidentally, I'm uh, making air quotes because we're on a podcast, Patton gives this talk in Nutsford that's not supposed to get any press play. And suddenly it's in the newspapers. And so it looks like the British kind of out Patton because the next day the Germans then start communicating and saying, hey, Patton's in England. He's, you know, they, they take the bait. And so it, the evidence looks like to me that the British deliberately outed Patton, you know, and I, they never told Eisenhower. So here Eisenhower is about to send Patton home and choose him out again and everything for something that was really not Patton's fault. You better tell us what he says at Nutsford, because it is nearly as big as the slapping incident for is a diplomatic faux pas. Right. It's actually a very simple vanilla speech. You know, it's, it's actually word, almost word for word in the uh, movie where he thanks the women for putting together this uh, place, uh, the R- uh, Russet House, I think it's called, for Americans to meet the locals and things like that. Very common in England. And he's like, you know, and since it's the destiny of the Americans and the British and the Russians to rule the post-World War, the better we know each other, the better, you know, we'll, things will go. And one of one of the three newspapers that covers it fails to put the Russians in the article. And so in the movie, that's the real, the linchpin of it. But really, it's Eisenhower's anger that Patton has, you know, has revealed himself to be in England. It's really, he doesn't really care about the contents of the speech. Now, back home, a lot of politicians are angry that Patton's just interjecting politics into a speech. You know, he talks about world leaders, you know, stuff like that. So it's not really that whole Russian linchpin that the movie revolves around. It's the fact that he he, he uh, reveals himself to be in England and that he talks politics when he shouldn't. And that's the real explosion. And to, to exacerbate everything, when Eisenhower finds out about this whole kerfuffle that's blown up in the press, he's coming back from a place called Slapton Sands. And this is where the rehearsal for D-Day has gone horribly wrong. And the Germans have, sh- you know, attacked the Americans. So he is not in the best of moods when he finds out that one of his army commanders has blabbed to the world that he's in England. It's the it's the problem of being uh, a, a well-known commander is that everyone hangs on your every word and then it gets reported and then the word gets around. And it's you know, part of his success is also part of his, his downfall <laughs> to be well-known and these things get talked about. Um, which it is sub, he's going to be subservient to Bradley. You knew this at the time. Bradley, it's a role reverse room because Bradley had been under him. How does he feel to be under Bradley? It differs, it differs from time to time. He obviously feels he's a better general and more experienced than Bradley. You know, he just ensconces himself so much into the work of Third Army that I think that is where his energy really goes. He's not pleased about it that he's been passed over for, for command when it happens. Um, he goes into that depression while alone in Sicily. In fact, Bradley goes to see him on his way to England to take command. And Bradley's like, my God, I think this guy's suicidal. I mean, he's really worried about Patton's mental condition. But once Third Army, once he starts training Third Army and leading it across Europe, he's kind of in the zone. And at that point, you know, he sees Bradley as just short-sighted because Patton seeing all these opportunities on the battlefield Bradley's worried about all these opportunities on the battlefield. He wants to keep things simple. And there are times where, you know, he overhears Bradley yelling at Eisenhower saying, you know, how can you deprive us of fuel and these things? And he's like, okay, we're on the same side, you know, or Bradley clashing with Montgomery and being infuriated with Eisenhower taking Montgomery's side. And Patton's like, welcome to my world that I was dealing with in Sicily, you know, so they do bond over a lot of things. But I think deep down, Patton felt he could do a better job and he should have been on that level. It's an interesting what if, isn't it? I, I, I sort of wondered if Patton had sort of reached a ceiling that he was very good at uh, in Europe. And actually, if you raised him above that ceiling, it might not be, he might, that might be a, a step too far. Found himself out of a job quite quick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a brilliant military commander, but he's got that short temperedness and that sort of erratic emotional level 
that, you know, Bradley possessed and Eisenhower wanted. He wanted the steady guys on the highest level. And that's what he got. And you want driving commanders who will drive. And whilst Patton's not driving from the front, he's as close as you're going to get. As, uh, that, yeah. Oof. He's there. He's, he's, he, he visits the front a lot. Um, uh, you know, you see it in the first volume of my book and then the second volume. I mean, there's reporters that go with him in the Jeep to the front and shells are blowing around them and everything. And they're like, oh, my God, this guy's crazy to be doing this. But he would go to observation posts and look over at the Germans. I mean, he really did get up close once you get into Europe. <laughs> what, what abused me was his uh, ability to come up to the front of a, a, a column, say, why have you stopped the cell? There's a minefield, wait for it to be cleared. And he'd just say, follow me, and just drive across the minefield three times. Three times. He leads the troops. In fact, this, this is all in North Africa. You know, here's a two-star or a three-star general leading the attack. And the third time he does it, they go for about an hour and a half. And he goes, you know what? I can't lead you guys anymore because we're about to meet the British. And if the first person the British meet when we link up is a two-star general, that's going to be humiliating. So he turns around and drives back. And within 10 minutes, those troops encounter the British. You know, I'm like, he really was leading them right up to the end, man. That's uh, and, and that, that, you know, that is a sign of a good general because he's got these green hesitant troops and his goal is to get to a certain location and boy, he did, he was not going to sit in the back and make excuses. As we're creeping towards uh, talking about Patton in Northwest Europe, we should probably leave things there and uh, I'll get you back later in the year to talk about uh, Patton's Normandy breakout. Thanks, Kevin. Loyal listener, if you want to buff up on Patton, Kevin's book is Patton's War and American General's Combat Leadership, Volume 1, November 42 to July 44. Don't forget, if you enjoy the podcast, why not consider becoming a patron? It is just me putting the whole show together and a dollar or pound from listeners like you helps me set aside the time to research, record and edit the show. You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. For patrons, I do make extras available, bits of interviews that might have been left on the virtual cutting room floor. And for patrons, there will be a bit more pattern chat. So that is patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Well, that's all from me for now. Next time we should be looking at Peleloo and Okinawa. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.